it numbs you a nightmare a horrible disease these are just a few of the ways people have described mental illness in their lives whether it's you your child or a friend mental illness impacts all of us in the same ways and that's why the mind space podcast is committed to uncovering mental illness and the impact it has so welcome everyone to the mind space podcast um hosted by me debbie trip Martin and Mark Caron, who are not going to be here with us in this particular episode. This one is a special one where we dive into um, surviving addiction and substance abuse. And um, we have a very special person who has joined us today, and I've had the privilege of interviewing him today. So for the new listeners, in case anyone is going through the same thing, I hope you can relate and maybe come out and we can get more of these stories online. So um, Fahad, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Mm. Glad to be here as well. How do you feel being here today? It's a great feeling mm. to be here to share my story. Mm. There will be very many mixed reactions, but yeah. it's for myself first. It's yourself first. As long as I do right by my road. Did you get any second thoughts on your way here? Not on my way here, but I mentioned it to a few people and they were skeptical. They were like, why are you putting yourself out there? Mm. But they, it's just they speak from a point of ignorance. No offense, because mm. I do believe by me sharing my story, you never know. There are tons of people out there who may relate to it, mm. and if we can just get a few of them to aspire for greatness, mm. then I believe we would have at least done our part. Okay. So um, you can tell us a bit about yourself, um, where you are right now, all that sort of thing, so the listeners can get a bit custom to you and yeah. All right, I am. I'm 23 years old. Um, I'm, as, I'm an aspiring business mogul. I'm an aspiring chef as well. Oh, you can cook? Yeah, I can whip up a nice meal. Really? Yeah, I'm actually, I go to the culinary school of Uganda as well. Ah, okay. For nine hours a week. Nine hours a week. Yeah, so I'm also a mental health advocate because I live the addiction life every day. Mm. You know, addiction is, you, you never recover from addiction. Mm. You're an addict for life. Mm. So, I have to be, I have to walk the journey every day. And I believe if I'm speaking about mental health every day, why not do outreach as well? You know, walk the talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, Fahad, I want to listen to your story today. I want to go into the deeper details of um, how this whole thing started and when and why. So, I'm just going to ask a bit of questions you don't have to really you know yeah. respond to anything you don't want to but yeah they're just gonna be out there so um how old were you when you first uh, started how how old was i let's see i was uh, i was pretty young we started experimenting with peppers and buying biscuits like the ordinary young children that have seen older people around them smoke mm-hmm. and drink and do whatever but my first real encounter with drugs was, I think, in my P4, when I had my first uh, spliff, or what they call my first joint, stick mm. of marijuana. Mm. So I think I was around, I don't remember. I don't remember. What's P4? P4 is around... P4, that's nine? Ten? Around eight, nine then. Mm. Yeah, so... So who introduced you to this? And it was a, a relative, actually, that... It was a relative. A relative, but mm. I don't think they did it with the intention of exposing me to it. They were equally as ignorant and equally as young as I. Oh, equally as young. Yeah, just a bit older than me, but mm. not in a position to know what's really right. Mm. Yeah, so that was my first encounter with, mm. with the drugs. With the drugs. Recreation, as they may call them, but it's still a drug. Mm. So yes. how did this make you feel? Um, before, uh, I mean, it was wild. You can only imagine. People do this in their campus years, in their late teens, but Mm. this is me. I'm not even the stage of puberty. Yeah. But I'm already having my mind exposed to this all other. You you had seen it somewhere on TV. That's is that how you decided to maybe try it out on your own? Or I was seeing someone using it as well. Yeah. And curiosity. So was it in the family and you saw someone, then you decided to try it with a family member, a different family member? or The same family member. The same family member. Yes. 
Uh. But it's not, I do not apportion blame to them. Mm. It was purely my own curiosity. They wouldn't have given it to me if I didn't ask for it. Mm. And you know, addiction is a family disease in so many aspects, in that even you, the addict, it not not only affects you, Mm. but also affects your immediate surrounding. Mm. But yet, because well, it's a family disease in an aspect that some people are born into active addiction. Mm. People are born into families of alcoholics, mm. families of smokers. So when you take into account people's formative years, and you know exposure comes at a cost. Mm. We have gotten so attached to the liberal ways of the West and forgotten our own principles in that you do not really know the effects of what you're taking in as a child. Mm. So some of these things we learned by seeing people around us do. Yeah. And eventually we also took on the habit because you know it was okay. Because it was okay. It was perceived to be okay. Yeah. But some of us took the high road. Is, um, is this why you went back a second time to do it again? Or? You never really know mm. when you're starting out because it's all fun and games. Yeah. Because before you do it, you see someone smoking a cigarette, mm. eventually you also smoke that and you get you. It's not really a really big thing, mm, mm. but as you grow into your teenage years, mm. you, you have prior experience mm. and prior exposure. So the rate at which you're going to operate at is not going to be the rate at which the average person your age will operate at. Okay, so you're in P4, you have out your first try, mm. this substance. Um, did you keep on going with the same substance or at somewhere along the road you were introduced to a different kind of thing? How did that go for you? I mean, I used mm. whatever I had access to. You never had it access didn't really to. matter what I was using. And weren't you supposed to be in school all yes, the time I, by I, that I, age? What, what time did you get to use? and? You know, you go out, you visit relatives, the holiday, the occasion, no, you know, there's always time for mm. sometimes you don't plan for what's going to happen at that yeah. age. Mm. You know, you're going here, you're visiting here, you don't really have a say in the crowds you go to. Mm. But luckily for me, I was also a bit big headed. Mm. So, as those kids who actually would roam around the village, mm. so, so it, it wasn't as strong because you had a time off to actually go to yeah, school. Yeah, I had time off to go to school because that yeah. was primary. That was primary. You couldn't really engage yourself in those habits. Yeah. Without being noticed or getting caught. So it was a bit passive. Yeah. Recreation, not even something to speak of. You could brag about it, but it wasn't really something to what? Mm. To take keen interest on. Okay. So what happens when you go into the secondary life? P7 vacation, actually. P7 vacation. Yeah, now that is game life. What happened then? Uh, that is um, that is when I think the alcohol kicked in. For a slight somewhat okay phase. It seems okay when you're starting out because they're drinking the Smanoffs, they're drinking, but these are 7.5 beers, you're drinking whatever words you can come across, mm. just because you want to feel cool and whatnot. Mm. But you do this for your whole six year journey in high school and it's, it's about to be a recipe for disaster. So were you doing this with the same relative? Or no, this, this was thing? now, you learn the habit and you, you can do it on your own. You get to associate with peers as well who do this habit. You no longer relate to your relatives or whoever you learned it from back then because it doesn't really matter. Mm. It's now your vice. It's now your vice. But it's not, you still have control over it because mm. it does not really send you to, you don't have the cravings as the full blown addict then. Yeah. You're more still on the recreational side of, I've landed into it, I've bumped into it here and there. Mm. You use, you don't really care. Mm. Was it still something more on the recreational side? Had you really gotten into it as recreation? When I reached senior one, senior two, I now became a bit... I used to have an excuse for it, actually. Mm. I, I picked it from a cousin of mine when he used to use so much. I used to ask them, why do you use so much? I re- you seem to be addicted. And they were like, no, I'm just dedicated to the cause. <laughs> you get <laughs> So it, it, it was a very nice punchline. Yeah. So whenever someone will be like, you're using, I'm like, no, man, I'm just dedicated to the cause. Yeah. I'm supporting the people out there. I'm supporting the businesses. I was giving yeah. myself an excuse to use. Yeah. And it helped for a period of time till, you know, you s- now it's, it's high school. Yeah. 
you are in um, I was in a single school you get now real access to things like kuba things like shisha things so and I was really the party goer the I mean form 1 form 2 for us were already going to bars throughout the whole night not as your friends are going home at 7 for you now the party is just what getting started but you forget to take into account you actually still a young child so eventually i had a few setbacks i was a very intelligent kid okay not very intelligent but i, I didn't have problems academically i come from a family of a bit gifted they are gifted intellectually so i've never really had to struggle with my academics but i had my first session i think i didn't know what to term it then i think i was around senior four we're going to do mocks yeah. we had just binged i don't know how much cheap alcohol i think at that time it was royal vodka mm -hmm. and a few blunts and my mind couldn't keep up I sh it shut down for the first time now it was later on that i got to discover that i was going through a phase of clinical depression um, what, what do you mean shut down? i used to call it a mind lock like I could hibernate, I could sleep for 22 hours a day. I had no appetite. I had no will to live. Nothing made sense. I doubted my surroundings. I doubted everything about me. It's like I was living a dream in the moment. I was so weak, yet I was very athletic at that time. I didn't know how to term it then. I just had to ride the wave. So this was in high school? This was in high school. And you had just noticed this now before it didn't matter or...? It had not happened before. It had not happened before. No. And I, I didn't know how to combat because I didn't have the knowledge. Okay. I didn't know where to blame it. Somehow I knew it was something to do with what I had taken. Yeah, I knew something wasn't okay. Yeah, because, you know, after binging and whatnot, the next day, mm -hmm. the next day I couldn't function. Mm -hmm. I couldn't function. The sense of hopelessness, so gripping. Eh? At that age, mm -hmm. I myself didn't know what was happening. So imagine the people around me, the school administration. Were they aware? They had their, they had some. their suspicions. They had suspicions. But you know, without evidence, these some of these well-off schools, uh, ch children really have rights. Yeah. And then in your circles, were they also doing the same thing, or it was just you hiding? Because this is oh, something yes, that started in high school. There's, there was no hiding. I mean, no yeah, hiding. in senior four, you have your people. But I was not those people that were influenced. I was the influencer. I will not hide that. I, I was the influencer. But I had my people who would be around us, you know, because we're the ones working in the bars, we're the ones organizing the parties, we're the, we're the cool kids, you get it? But we all had very many things in common as well. Okay, so what happened when you joined the school? Like the mocks? Mm. Ah, it was... Uh, it was a whole other experience, actually. It's been a while since I thought about it. But all I remember was I, I had to do the papers. Yeah. I wouldn't escape them, but I did the papers. Yeah. And I really did. I, I delivered in my own. You know, books have really never been a problem. I never really had to stress that I have exams. I didn't have to worry. So even in that situation, I found a way of dragging myself to do those papers. So at this point, had you realized that you actually had it bad? Still just about I had no problem. You had no problem. I had no problem yeah. in my mind. Where was the problem? What, what kept you going back to it and doing this? Going back to it, it was fun. It was fun. I mean, you're, this is an era where people are going for coaching. Mm. This is an era where there's a lot of money. Okay, not a lot of money, but you have access. Yeah. And you're, you need to be going out because I didn't like staying home. Mm. So Monday to Saturday, I was out. not really aware but they were they were aware of my outings mm -hmm. they they knew i was i used to leave home at 6 a.m and i've come be coming home back like at 11 p.m 12 on a saturday friday there you would expect me the next day and they had no problem with it it's not that they had no they had a problem with it mm -hmm. but i was too big-headed to be put on a leash so they they had tried to act on your behalf. yeah they really tried they really did try because i come from a muslim family but at that time, I wasn't really practicing. So, not. your relative who you were using this animal as your God-grandson to the point of dropping to leave you, he, like, he or she, should 
Because no, no, no. Like in the district? He never, they never did talk to me about anything. They didn't? Okay. No. Mm-hmm. Like you can feel like a suspense? There was never any suspense. There was never any suspense. There was never any suspense. There was never, I was the one telling him you're using too oh, fast. Because okay. okay. he was the one who had the problem. Okay. He was the one who was going to rehabilitation. He was on in and out of police. He was in and out of trouble. There was no light. There was no spot on us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that time you're still, no one knows what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Apart from that, he stays out late, doesn't like staying home. That's basically what they know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what happened when you proceeded to come out? Elena. Ah. Things began to blur a lot. The upside is that very beautiful. I don't really regret any of them. But you can only imagine now where, where the school, where the top people get a chance to come back to the school. Mm-hmm. You're the best criminal, but you're the best leader. So it's a win-win for the school. As you, so they let you study. They know your vices, but... So you were a leader in school? No, I was. Everything, academically, so sports. So this, this um, had never at all interacted with academics? Academics, no. Mm-hmm. I can't say. Social life? Social life eventually. Okay. Eventually, but not in high school. Okay. In high school, it's, wha- it's one of the things that made us cool. Yeah. You get, I mean, you're, you're rubbing shoulders with. Mm-hmm. You're in a bar, like Panamera in a bar, like, yeah. you get. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're that short, you're that. So if you're smoking the cigarette and smoking the blunt, you're cool. you think you're cool. Yeah. But now I look back on it. So what happened when you had to do this like school law and friends, school friends, you know. swag and stuff, and you had to step back into the real life. Real life. And you have to go back home and maybe from vacation, I'm imagining, yeah. staying in campus. Oh, senior six that? vacation. Yeah. I think after I was done with my papers, I left that that January, that New Year's, I left home. You moved back home. Yeah. Because yeah. I was moving too fast. Now I felt like I needed more in life. Did you As give any reason for it? I didn't give anyone reason. I didn't. I, I grew up not asking for permission. I didn't need permission to do anything. Weren't your parents concerned that you never go into police? Yeah, but it depends on to what degree are you willing to punish your child, and how how much do you know your child to that extent? That you know, most of no offense, but the schools and the settings people are growing up in these days, there's really no the parent to child ratio, care and time. People barely know their children. Barely. I mean, I've been in school all my life. I've been, you only see me in the holiday, in the holiday, I'm running away from you. I, I go to school, I, read, I deliver you, I bring the report home. I'm, I'm not going to trouble you with many things. So I'm, I'm trying to think more on the financial side. The financial side. Because you have a lot of home. And, um, did you have your own things going on? Because sometimes parents are supporting like your children up to a certain age, have you? No, I've, not, I've, not, I've never been a person to really reach out to my family for finances. Because mm-hmm. um, I've been raised by a very strong, independent woman who has been through a lot herself. And I've had to see her go through these things, and I felt to, to a certain extent it wasn't my right to burden her. But at the end of the day, my not asking for help led me down a very dark path. Because I mean, if in all of us organizing parties in bars, mm-hmm. that is Form 1, Form 2. By the time I reached Form 6, I was now organizing large scale events, let them be in rugby, let them be. Money was not a problem. I was at the top of my game. I had the, the networks. I was not the average person. I was, I was doing very well off. I didn't need, you didn't need the, the, the home support. support. No, I didn't need home support. So this went on the entire vacation? Yeah, close to two years. Close to two years. Yeah, I moved out. I got a job. Got the money coming in. I was living on my own. Mm-hmm. But it came at a cost. But do you want to, can you describe how that time was living on your own? Because now you have no roof, you have no money. Exactly. Yeah. I had no one to answer to. And that freedom, the, the availability of mm. substances to use and the routine that you have built up for yourself. Mm. 
So ironically, a friend of mine I met sometime and was like, we all actually used to converge, but we all more or less came from broken families. Mm-hmm. Like no one was really, there was not enough pressure at home to get you back there if you left. Because mm-hmm. I had, yes, there was a lot of pressure, but you, it's very hard to outsmart your child, especially a child who has grown up in these streets. You get so yes, the police came looking after me. They did this, they did that. But at the end of the day, I was gone. And I had my own money. I was taking care of myself. So I knew where the drugs were. I knew where the women were. I knew where everything was. I was basically living the dream. So at this point, um, have you tried to experiment with any other substances? No, yes, actually. Because in my elevator, I actually had my second session, mental breakdown. I think it was in senior five. I had another session that lasted, I think, two, two and a half weeks. Okay. Yeah, I was just we were right in rugby season, actually. Mm-hmm. And I shut down. Because you come from being very energetic to you can't, you can't operate. You Did s- you actually acknowledge that something was happening? At that moment, mm-hmm. I started to really now get concerned a bit. Just like, yes. eh, it happened two years ago and it's recurring. I'm like, eh, what's happening? But I was still calling it a mental, mental lock or something. Mm-hmm. So like, it's okay. But remember, this I was taking, it was shisha. I was making shisha for bars. I was a smoke guy. I myself would be smoking like three pots a day. So three pots a day, six days a week. It has to catch up. Mm-hmm. Did you have any people you consider close friends to you at this time? Or it was only you and your friends? No, I had some, I had friends i had so many acquaintances i was quite popular okay that's that's what i wanted to actually i made the difference between a friend and an acquaintance yes so you had both friends and acquaintances yeah i had both friends and acquaintances because i didn't really need friends i knew who my people were because mm-hmm. i was seeing my people every day of the week at the bus yeah at the wherever would link up those were my people then there were the rest who knew us because i mean you're hanging out in our sports mm-hmm. these are not your sports like tomorrow you want to be here but we will be here I didn't have a problem, remember? Oh, I, I didn't have a problem. You didn't have a problem. Yeah. Okay. So you began to experiment with other things as well in this time frame? Yeah, already by this time I've gotten exposed pretty. I've gotten my fair share of exposure. Mm-hmm. And at that time now, the speed. Speed went down. Yeah, it now went off because I've, I've always been moving very fast in my life. I don't know what I've been, I didn't know what I was chasing. But I, all I knew was I was going. I didn't know I was going, but I was going somewhere. But you could see you were also going. I didn't know at that moment, because at that moment, I mean, I was, I was living the dream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I reached a point where I actually moved in with someone else. And this person was like 10 years older than me. And I mean, it was like a 10 year gap. Mm-hmm. But I was out competing them. And they had the resources to actually maintain their their habits. So even my money it reached a point I didn't need to work. I didn't need to actually go to work. I didn't need to go to the bar. I didn't need the things were now finding us at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So before, uh, back then, I mean, you have you were in school? Were mm-hmm. you still in school? When in first term now, the two years after O level, had you started campus or you I dropped out of campus actually. But I didn't I didn't even bother. You didn't bother? I didn't bother. You know when you've just left school mm. and you, you get a test of money? Yeah. That's now a whole different ball game. I mean, what, what are you going to tell me if, I'm, if, I, if I have building the resources mm. to hold this much money? Mm. What are you going to tell me I about the I mean, the end game is money, right? Yeah, the, the end game is money. money. So mm. why, why don't just focus on the money and mm. maybe that will not be that video. Was the mother aware? Well, she was aware, but were well, a bit detached that moment because I didn't really think I needed her. So education, I, I stalled as much as I can. I was supposed to go to the diaspora because, mm. I mean, they, they had the facilities to get me there. Mm. They had the facilities. So it was basically on me. I didn't want to. It was more or less of settling. Mm. I've always been questioning systems and our Ugandan education system is not one mm. that I would consider adequate. Is it safe to say you didn't really have responsibilities? 
I didn't have any responsibilities. Have any responsibilities. It was just me, my fun, and vibes. What was the routine like? The routine? Mm. When I left the work and all that, I wake up every day to use. You wake up every day to use? Yeah, even when we don't have food in the house, mm. we, we have the alcohol, we have the cigarettes, we have the marijuana, mm. and the girls will be coming over. Mm. I mean, if that's your lifestyle, seven days a week, for a full yeah, what, what what more do you want? Um, during this time, did you ever act recklessly or do or endanger your life or someone else's life while you're under that influence? Numerous times. Numerous times. Numerous times. Those that know me know I love to drive. So I mean, if you sat in my car back then, mm. odds are you'd really really feel it. Mm. So picture we've gone out and I'm drunk. Even if it's your car, you want to drive me. Mm. It was now imprinted so much into my mind as now disrespecting other people's property. Mm. And I, I actually endangered myself so many times. So many times were fighting other people in funny places, in Kanta, and getting in touch with thieves. You know, as our friends are running away from the thieves, we're running towards <laughs> them. You get Because yes, we have... That's crazy. Yeah, the Kabuli, I mean... Rugby, the things I attained, mm. very few people can actually say they, they had the privilege of, of yeah. living the life I did. Mm. Yeah. Did you, you mentioned something about you know, the police running after you. Did you get some legal issues along the way as well? Oh, every year eventually you get arrested. That, that is when, mm. you're, when you're using. Because you know you get now exposed to, to higher classes of drugs. Mm. In that now marijuana... Marijuana is just, mm. it's child's play. Mm. You've been, you remember my first spliff was at four, when I was in P4. So how many years has it been? I, I actually need to go higher, the speed I'm going. So that's when I got introduced to class A substances, mm. heroines. I got introduced to the codeines. Mm. Yeah. So three days on heroin, you don't need much. You become dependent on it. I reached a point when resources, I wasn't really buying the drugs myself. I didn't need to. I'd go to some of my relatives and they would be on this. I would go to my friends, they would be on it. I'd build up the social capital not to... I mean, just having me around was the party. What, what was it that kept you going back at this point? Because, I mean, from one drug, you're going to another. What was it that you were trying to feel, changing the drugs? And, you know, apart from the swag and the socials and yeah. everything, how exactly did you feel... At this point, you want to go back and do it again anyway. Do it again because it felt nice. It felt nice. Felt nice. You see, those drugs, the closer you are to death, the sweeter. Yeah. I mean, when the blackout is is you you are going, mm. that's when the height is is at the peak. Mm. So, but remember, every hit, mm. you want it. You want to feel the euphoria of the first time you used it. Yeah. So. You keep on coming back. You know, it sets out all fun and games. You have power over addiction. You have yeah. control. And you use and you use. And, but three months down the road, if you miss a day, you, can fall, you fall sick. Mm. Now that's when you lose power over the substance. Yeah, you know, there's this um, excuse people want to, like to give. Yeah. Why are you drinking? Oh, I have problems. Yeah, I have. You don't even know what I'm going through. Yeah. But it's like to you, you didn't acknowledge that you actually had, had problems, problems and you were just going, diving head in. Yeah, this time I was now just running away from my reality. You were just running away from I was now escaping my reality. So you actually realized there were no problems? Yeah, but I was still big headed and I still believed I was right. Mm. And I still believed no one could tell me anything. I knew it all. So there was nothing to confront. Have you gotten more episodes of the mental look? The mental look? Mm. I got one. Two years, I think, after I left school. Mm. And, oh, uh, this one really hit me hard. What happened? You know what about? It really, really hit me hard. This time, I'd actually moved into a friend's place. Mm. And I almost nearly also ruined that relationship. Because he didn't know how to handle me. I was behaving in manners... But he was not accustomed. I wasn't the person he knew. Mm. 
So I had to leave him, move to another person's place. I picked up more habits. My cigarette consumption now really took off. Because, you know, when he couldn't sleep. And, you know, cigarettes give a head rush, a head buzz. So now from smoking five cigarettes, I was smoking a packet. So you actually smoked more than you had planned to. Yes. Is it safe to say that? Yes. Mm. Yeah, I really did. I really, really did overshoot. And there are moments when you try to take it a bit slow, but... You can never take it a bit slow. Mm. Especially at the height of active addiction. Mm. When you're at the peak, there's really no slowing down. Because you're, you're no longer a recreational user. Mm. You no longer have the willpower. You have stopped being a functional user. Um, now you're dysfunctional. Yeah, but that's because you know now. But then, without what you know now... Yes, but then I was, I'd now become dysfunctional. Yeah, become dysfunctional. Yes, that now I'm no longer working, I'm no longer engaging in social activities. I am in my un- own bubble, just me and using. Mm. I, I no longer had friends, it was just me and my using. Mm. It was my escape from the reality I'd created for myself. That's why I kept on going back. Yeah. When did you realize you had it bad? When did you actually realize? That I had it what? bad? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I got checked into rehab. <laughs> that is that is when you realize you had it bad yeah that all was... this time you thought you were okay no yeah. I and mean they arrest you they do what but at the end of the day you understand the effects the money the psychosis that comes with all these things do you actually have some moments you lost of your life which you can't recall lapses in memory yeah they are. Mm. but of course I mean, what was I doing for for it's a period over here? I can't like six months. I can't account for. So till they got you in rehab, they thought you were okay and you had no problem. Yeah, but I I did I I led myself to rehab. Like the steps are very vivid. Because mm. those that know you, you they'll see you and they'll know this is not the person I know. When did your mother find out? When did she find out yeah. that I had a problem? I they called her when I was in a police station. Mm. Yeah. I'd, uh, I'd beaten up, I'd not beaten up, but I got into a fight with these LDs. I think there were like 12 of them. Yeah. And I gave them a run for their money. Mm. Yeah, but society has it. People call rank. So I was really never charged, but that was it now. That's when she actually was started she, suspecting you know, or confirming. Started suspecting. And the things I was talking about, there was a lot of grandiosity going on in my life. There was a lot of grandiosity. Now, I thought I had it all, but I had nothing. Mm. So you go on telling people, I have this, I have that. You have nothing. Mm. You, you are, they call them buffeting. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you have nothing you're doing with your life. You're just looking for the next deal. Do you have any other siblings at home? Mom, I'm an only child. My only child. Yes. So this is you, an only child, moving out of your mother's house into the entire world. Um, closest person, your relative, who actually is the one who introduced you to the drugs. Not actually, I won't say my closest relative. Mm. It's just a relative I have of mine. Relative. I have very many relatives okay. that are actually in the game. I've been institutionalized with my relatives. I, it's a family disease. I have relatives that have died from mm. alcoholism. Mm. Yeah, this so is they knew. They knew how it, it had been going for you. After I moved out of home, they knew that you were dealing with these issues? Some really knew, but I was, I was running from them because the people were saying he's now suicidal. Mm. I'm like, I might have a few issues, but why would you think I would want to kill myself? Mm. They're looking after you, they're running after you, but they can't really find you. Yeah. And you're not yet to that level of dysfunctionality. That something has really happened, they actually have to come to your rescue. So if, if you think they knew, don't you think your mother was suspecting at any point? She knew. She knew. But it was really out of her hands because mm. I was a full grown person and I'd left. Did she try to confront you at any time? Yes, she did. She sent police after me. She, she looked for me herself. But I mean, if I wasn't going back, I wasn't going back. Mm. Yeah. Is there a time where these habits um, gave you some psychological or physiological effects? No, yeah, so for sure. Which ones? Minus the, the clinical depression, I had mania. I had drug-induced psychosis. I mean, physically, I was a sportsman, so I knew the essence of sports. Mm. 
mm. but I couldn't run a mile for you. Mm. I've coughed blood. I've had breathing issues. I feel like I'm drowning yeah. when I'm in a pool of water. Mm. Even just when I'm showering, mm. I feel like I'm drowning. So my health really took a toll. Mm. Yeah, my mental health took a toll as well. My physical health, my spiritual, everything about me became really hopeless. And you realized this in rehab or before rehab? No, in rehab I was still in denial, the first stage. Mm. I had no problem. Yeah, I had no problem. Mm. Actually, I, I attained my recovery after my stints in rehab. Because you go, you come out, you go, you come out. And me, I, I never used to delay. The mm. day you release me is the day I go back. Mm. Um, do you ever feel, or can you describe um, how it felt when, you know, the relatives are calling you, this, you know, labeling you, yeah, labeling running you. after you? Yeah. How did that make you feel? Did it push your father into the use anyway? No. Mm. It takes a psychological toll on you because, you know, you're part of the Panyubi and Jaga crew mm. the world has defeated you mm. you're very hopeless you, you know, so many things will be said about you not even just your family but those people you thought were really your friends you you get to find out in those moments that they will say the the most hurtful things but you know i've learned to forgive others because i've learned to forgive myself i still i understand even i was not in my best shape Mm. So they might have had the right to say the things they said. So rather than coming to you and talking to you, they were saying things about yeah, you. Yeah, about me. Yes, no one actually could say anything to me. Why do you think that was? Because of my character. I'm a very overbearing person. Mm. I do not like to be led. Mm. I don't, I, and I, at that moment, I didn't like to be told. Because mm. no one had ever told me anything. So you took yourself to rehab? How did that happen? I didn't take myself to rehab. But you took the steps to rehab? No, 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 no. That was my cousin on the second stint I took him. Yeah. Me, I was always dragged there. Always? There's been more than once? Yes, yes. There's the first time I was conned. One was spiritual. Another was police. I had to be escorted by police. Mm. Yeah, really. There have never been pretty sins. Though the last time I, 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 I overdid it. I think they would, if there was a medal, they could award, I would really have a medal. Um, how long would you spend that? Or you'd run away? or You you run the treatment program, but I was so manipulative. Mm. You know, ordinary treatment model is 90 days. Mm. 90 days for someone who has deals to crack. Even, in the, even when I was in the system, I remember the first rehab I went, I think I, I was there for, for two weeks. Did I even make two weeks, a week and some? And I had already manipulated my, my way out of what? Of, of rehab, yes. I got my mom, I, I spoke to her, I, I cried, I what? I did whatever I could. Mm. So I got out on that very day. Mm. I, I relapsed. So, you know, sometimes they try to talk to you about getting better. So all this, you never bothered to take it in. They were just talking and your mind was decided, I don't need this, I'm not going to listen. The first time? Yeah. I Wasn't there anything it. which actually cut through to you? The first time? Yeah. There was nothing they could tell me. Because mm. I was actually there with a relative as well. There was nothing they could tell me. Me, I needed to go. Needed to I knew me, I was okay. All the people you have put me in have a very big problem. Mm. So when, when was it when you actually opened your eyes and then realized... I have to stop. It, I have to get clean. I have to get sober. It was after my my last stint in rehab, where after I went home, I went. I got some false information that relapse is part of recovery, which it's not. Relapse is a sign of addiction manifesting itself again. So I went with this notion that it's okay to relapse. It's part of recovery. You're not giving yourself an excuse. Yeah, to and indeed I relapsed mm. with grace. <laughs> you get. Yeah. And lo and behold, I left home again. Mm. And I went now back into the real system. Mm -hmm. Vengefulness. I felt I had to compensate for all the what? The time I had missed. Mm. And it wasn't a nice sight.
I actually also experienced another wave of suffering because I was now also we call them bendos. Bendos. Yeah, you know what a bendo. They sing about them actually a lot. Bendos, bendos what bandos where guys link up like if it's your yard, your home, mm. but your your boys come through and it's a boys' yard. You know what happens there? Mm. Testosterone levels are up the roof. Smoke is all over the place. Drinks are all over the place. Plans are being made. And yeah. It reached a point where in the band we were just two people, but <laughs> I mean, we're even going cheap. Yeah. Really cheap. Like, really, really, really cheap. I didn't ever think I would ever drink a sesa in my life. Mm. But oh my God, I would. It got so worse for having a sesa bottles in parties because you just couldn't do it. Yeah. And, you know, and people were talking about Torero some time back, but I think the first weekend Torero came up, we took like 70 bottles. 70? Yeah, 70 bottles of Torero. Oh. It was a three-day party because mm. it reached a point where we were very idle. We would party for a full week. Mm. So, um, how many, after how many episodes of um, rehab sessions, not even relapse, yeah. but rehab sessions, did you actually decide to try and work on yourself? I had a very good counselor mm. the last time I was in rehab. And she actually, I, I actually got quality treatment. Mm. Despite the fact that I was in denial, I actually got quality treatment. So this treatment, I actually came out with it. Mm. And the counselor really, really believed in me. And I actually had an improvement in quality in life. Mm. Though I reached a point where I had suffered too much. I mean, I reached the point of Okoye. Mm. I was really tired. It, it takes a very great courage to to use yourself to death every day and get back tomorrow the next time and do it again. Mm. But still maintaining the will to live. You got tired. It reached a point in I really have nothing else to live for. I mean, um, most cases, when something happens like that, at least for the cases we have had in the papers, it usually doesn't end well. It usually doesn't end well, especially when you reach a point like that. Mm. But for you seeing you turn right back around, that's really amazing. So what was that ultimate, you know, thing that kept you going, that ultimate reason why you turned around? The ultimate thing? Yeah. I had really, really suffered from someone who had been so privileged, even in their days of active addiction. Mm. I had reached rock bottom. I had really reached rock bottom. I had compromised personal beliefs and principles. I thought I would never, never think... When I crossed those lines, it reached a point where I didn't know who I was anymore. Because, you know, everyone is telling you this, everyone is telling you that. You're this, you're that, you're failure, you're this, remove you get. Mm. So the pressure got to me. And I was still going through these challenges. Mm. But I knew I, need, I, needed, I needed change. I knew life, at least there are so many stories I, I got to, to hear of people who had been in worse situations than I had been. And they, they gave me hope. Mm -hmm. They actually gave me hope that if someone could engage in bestiality, you could engage in murder, you could engage in... And you can actually get your life back on track. Mm -hmm. Why can't I, who has not yet really done the worst of the worst, not live a better life myself? Yeah. So at the back of my mind, I always knew the Lord would not test me with anything beyond my what? My control. And I knew I was a very strong person. Did you reconnect with God in rehab? Or? Actually, ironically, whenever I tried to pray to God, he, I always ended up in rehab. Honestly. Mm. Like the first time I knew things were going, I was flying. I mean, I was very arrogant. I had some money to back it up. But I actually said a prayer out of the blue. I was very emotional. A month later, I was in rehab. Police, <laughs> police takes it to rehab. Yeah. yeah. I come out. Hey, I'm there hustling life. I'm in rehab. Mm. So it's only now that I look back that the things I prayed for were actually Happening. given to me. The Lord actually helped me. Yeah. Me going to, re going to these rehabilitation centers was actually a blessing. Yeah. Because this is where I actually found help and hope. Mm. Because a person who has no hope or faith is, is really dead inside. Mm. You're merely existing, you're not living. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, 
there's no recovery without a higher power. And I know for a fact there's no recovery without support. Mm. But seeing as some of your family members are already in rehab, some of them are the ones offering you these things, how did you even make it? The stigma mm. and all that. Yeah. I look back now and I know I really had a very strong mother. Like a, this is a person I may have been fighting for a much bigger part of my life. Mm. But I look back now and I see the unconditional love a mother has for her child. Mm. I know I'm not yet at that point where I can truly understand because yeah. I've not yet been given the opportunity to be a parent myself. Mm. But now I understand mm. that she only meant well for me. Even in those moments when I thought I could put women or girls mm. before her, I know now that it's futility. That was a losing battle that I was what? I was fighting. So I didn't have so many people in my corner. Mm. I didn't have so many people in my corner. Unlike people who are allowed to get people visited in rehabilitation, I had one visitor who is the person I really do want to see the most. Yeah. But I knew I had something to prove. Not to anyone, but I had something to prove to myself. Mm. So she was and or is still actively involved in your treatment process, the recovery process? Yes, she is, because she has been very patient with me. Mm. It takes time. That is what most people don't understand, that these people are not educated yeah. about these things. Yeah. They, they only speak and judge from their own perspective. So it's up to you to be empathetic and you really understand that they may not really understand where you're coming from. So you don't really blame family for being away, taking a step back, no, no, um, no, no, not no, being no. patient with that you. Is very, that would be very selfish of me. I led myself. I made those decisions. Mm. I cut those ties. You get I behaved in a way that was unbecoming of me. It would be very unfair of me to apportion blame. Then I would. I was apportioning oh, then it. You would. Yes, then I was, I mean. Mm. But now come to think of it, it's never their fault. Mm. They don't do it in a way that they want to hurt you. It's just how you react to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, how long have you been clean for? I subscribe to ANNA. Mm -hmm. I last took my last puff of heroin, I think, in 2019. 2019. Around November, December there. Mm. I've not had any since. Alcohol have been sober since early this year mm. because of a tragic incident that happened to a long friend of mine mm. that really affirmed my faith because you know I'd gotten back onto the spiritual wagon and that relapse, I won't say it was necessary mm. but I don't regret it. You don't regret it. He was an alcoholic and he was one of the few people that didn't have a chance to make it out alive. Mm. Yeah. So I relapsed during the period of his burial. But after that... Did you quit both of them at the same time? No. Or you quit one before the other? Yeah, yeah, quit one before the other. Because mm -hmm. you see, even narcotics is actually encompassing. I would actually... It would be very hypocritical of me to say I quit heroin. Because those classy substances, yes are very, very major because those are things that really bring you the biggest problems. Mm. But we cannot fail to take into account these other small things like the marijuana, yeah. the cigarettes, mm. the alcohol. I used to call that the Rolex. You have the eggs, the chapati and tomatoes. Mm. So if you're having that every day yeah. for six months, you're also bound to have issues. Mm. So I've been, I've still had a challenge with some cigarettes here and there, I won't lie but not to the level that is very alarming not actually when he relapsed when he died and went to bury i think that is when i had my feel of cigarettes mm. yeah but for the other drugs have you actually had moments when you think about using or really come so close to using to using to them? breaking down to break it down other drugs the yeah. codeines yeah. the promethazines yeah. no i no longer have an attachment to those substances Mm. Are you confident you can't use again? 
I, w- I can never say I'm confident I'll never use again mm. because I'm an addict for life. Mm. But all I know is that today I will not use. Mm. And hopefully if I do not use today, I would have accomplished something that will give me strength mm. to do it again tomorrow. Because mm. it's, it's one day at a time. You do not rush recovery. Yeah. Have you had any side effects from not using? The withdrawals, yes, are always there, but they're temporary, they're short-lived. They're short-lived. They're very, very, they're part of the excuse that we give. Mm. How am I going to sleep? That fear of the unknown. Yeah. Because now being high becomes the new normal. It's the new sober. You can't function without yeah. intoxicants. You can't move out of your house without intoxicants. You can't hold a conversation without intoxicants. You get it? So... We need, I needed to learn new habits. I needed to learn how to sleep sober. I needed to learn how to eat food without lighting up a cigarette or marijuana or whatever. Mm. And so is a, I needed to learn how to live life. Mm. So that fear of the unknown comes back to the attachment of spirituality. Yeah. That some things, that is when you actually accept because the first step is you accepting powerlessness over your, 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 your problems and you submit them to a higher power. Because only he can return you to what? To a place of sanity. Mm. So you are only a human being. You can only do so much for me. Mm. But if I really do have belief in my higher power, I know I can do it for him. Apart from the withdrawal, have you had any other physiological damages or any other damages to your body? To my lungs, yes. I was very, very, I was a um, heavy smoker. Mm. Never smoker who, I mean, when you, when you reach the point of coughing blood, and it's not because of anything else but using, mm. you know what's happening inside there. Yeah. But the beauty about the body is it has the ability to repair itself. It will not take an instant, mm. but with time, you'll get back to, to a, a back standard to performance, yeah. depending on the effort you put in as well. So I've had a few issues with my... Okay, so... <laughs> yeah. On the, um, on the side of, you mentioned something about depression yeah. and, you know, the mania phases and all that. How have you actually handled that other side? Because as much as they, inter- they intersect, you know, treating them is a bit different. Yeah. How have you managed to, you know, handle this and this at the same time? The beauty about it is that the depression, psychosis, and mania all occurred at different times. So I got to experience all of them and got to really embrace how they would feel. That now I'd know I'm manic. I reached a point where I could diagnose myself. I, I just want to confirm the year you last went to rehab. 2019. 2019. Okay. Yeah, 2019 was the last year I went to rehab. Mm. So what, what are these changes, some of the changes you have, you've had to make in your life to make sure you don't slip back into that same place you That's are? That's some stage. Yeah. These are changes you make every day to remain grounded. I had to work on my spirituality. Mm. I was Muslim by name, but not Muslim by faith and action. Mm. I needed to understand that I am a Muslim man in a secular world. And... There were in, therein lies the blessing in this guy. Is, yes, my friend lost his life, mm-hmm. but he set a precedent. Mm-hmm. It was then that I realized that any time it can be you. This, this is a boy who, who brought out the best in me. Like, I attribute so many things to him. He's the reason, one of the reasons why I went back home to my mother. The few successes I had, he was partly behind them. So when he lost his life, in the manner in which he did, it really, it was an awakening to me that, you know what, any time can be your time. Because mm-hmm. I was already on a spiritual journey. I was already in recovery before his death. Mm-hmm. So when his death occurred, if I was not in a state of spiritual, mm-hmm. in a spiritual awakening, I would have handled it in a very different manner. So one of the things I've had, to, the first major thing I've had to do is try to remain grounded in my faith and religion. Because I know if I'm taking it one step at a time and one day at a time, it means I'm going to behave. I have 24 hours a day and the Lord just wants 25 minutes of it. If I can fulfill 25 minutes a day to my Lord, 
I have fulfilled my end of the bargain. The rest I leave to him. Yeah. I can only do so much. So, and other things is identifying my triggers. Because you understand your triggers. The old people you used to use with, the places you used to go to. Because there are hotspots in these places. They don't sell class A substances. You won't get pethidine in Boise. Because all the people who have been to rehab, it's, it's a tight-knit network. And the rehabs that cost even the clientele know themselves. So you mean the, the, the dealers who sell these things actually know who to give? They just don't give out just like yeah, that? Yeah, they don't. They are, they are substances you, you can't just buy. Yeah. You actually have to know who is who. Yeah, you just don't buy. Yeah, you don't just buy. Um, how do you feel um, with these drugs being around wherever you go in life? Because, I mean, not everyone knows what you're going through. Yeah. Maybe you are at a party and you, you, you can't anticipate anything. Because, yeah. I mean, your life has to still go on. Yeah. You're not going to stop going for birthday parties yeah. or a family function. How do you feel going there, seeing what used to be your favorite drink? Yeah. Seeing, you know, how do you handle that? It's a level of self-awareness mm. that I know that if I partake in that, I know where it is going to end up. Mm. And it comes, it's, it's planning. Mm. If you don't have a plan for these streets, the streets will have a plan for you. Yeah. So if I know I'm going somewhere, mm. you, you assess the crowd already. You already have an idea. Yeah. If you know they are going to use, you automatically know your main goal is not to use. Yeah. And if you have the opportunity of not just going, do not go. Because mm. it's rather stupid putting yourself in harm's way sometimes. Mm. You know, these people of yours, they don't give it small. For them, they're going to give it for four days, for five days. Mm. And if you go there, they will expect you to partake. Because some people don't really care about your boundaries. Because they're still living their own life. So you don't really cut chains with some social circles? I don't really look out for some people anymore because we give access to people and at the end of the, at the, end of the day we pay for it because when, when I'm sober, I, you run a different life than when you're an addict because when you're, you're looking for your next fix, the ghetto is your place. But what do you feel is the attitude of community towards this whole drug abuse? Drug abuse, it's just a misconception. It's, just misconception. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ignorance, blissful ignorance. And you can't blame it on them. Though ignorance has no defense. But do you think more needs to be done? Though? Yes, a lot of awareness needs to be done. So much more awareness because addiction is just a response to human trauma and suffering. Yeah. People have gone through so many things. That's why not everyone that goes to the bar is drinking because they are happy. Yeah. Now, um, my perception of the awareness, I may want to make me a bit different because mm. I've actually been there. Maybe I may say, let's do ads on TV or something. Yeah. But to a person who has actually been there and felt it, what kind of awareness do you think um, people struggling out there may need which may actually make an impact? Specialized care. Specialized care. Because oh. mm. when you look at the treatment model in the world for addiction, 90%, actually 95% is a failure. The treatment model is just out there to improve people's quality of life. That they will get you from being a dysfunctional user to a functional user. But in that period, you will have attained a better quality of life. Because if you leave rehab and you attain nine months of sobriety and you relapse, you relapse but on the foundation of your nine months of sobriety. Yet, so if, even if you relapse to one extent where you're re-institutionalized, the chances of you actually having a smoother transition back into society, mm. that is basically their main aim. They don't really care to address the individual trauma behind the usage. Because mm. by the time you reach a rehabilitation center, you are more or less to them dysfunctional. But yet you just, most people are just misunderstood. Mm. They're going, they have so much suffering that even they do not know. They don't know they are suffering. Yes, so what advice know. would you actually want to give out to all those people suffering and struggling right now, um, people who may be listening? Yeah. What, what advice can you actually offer? The advice out there is there's a lot of hope. Mm. I mean, the, you have been so courageous enough to make it this far through your suffering, so 
you are stronger than the ordinary human being in more ways than most. So all I know is there's hope out there for you if you're willing to change. If you're willing if you're willing to aspire for your dreams to come true, all the things they said you could not achieve or all the things you think you cannot achieve but once dreamt of achieving, they are still possible. So if you do believe your life is worth something, there's always hope for you. Only if you are willing to take it. Because the people out there that are willing to help addicts, we just have to create the foundations for them to actually get this hope. That was a powerful message. Yeah. What advice would this current you, what advice or message would you give to you five years ago? What five would you ago. have wished you had known better? Young boy, slow down. <laughs> slow down. Slow down. Slow you down. live fast, you die young. Yeah. So is that how you are now, living life slow and down? Right now? Yeah. One day at a time. One day at a time. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. I mean, I only have today mm. to make a better future for myself. Okay. So what happens from here? What happens from here? I run a very successful campaign mm -hmm. that I, I actually use myself. It's called the Boss Campaign. Boss and campaign. Yeah, the Boss Campaign. Because I aspire to be a business mogul. Yeah. So I have to emulate habits of successful people. So it's an acronym for Build Habits of Success. I have four aspects because people view success differently. There's the mental aspect, the religious aspect, the social aspect, mm -hmm. and the health aspect. So I believe if you work on these four aspects daily, I mean, get up and take care of your body, work out when you can, talk to your Lord as you understand him mm -hmm. every day, work on your social life, do good because the effect of karma is out there and cause and effect. As well as expand your mind, because the mind is a muscle. Yeah. And knowledge to it is, is its workout. Mm -hmm. So if I can work this campaign every day, it will help me stay grounded in my recovery. And I know if the Lord gives me life 20 years from now, I'll be a force to reckon with. Yeah. How do you feel about um, your story here? Because I engage in... So I mean, in a few NNAA meetings, sharing is now part of my recovery process. It takes a great deal of humility to, to share what you have been through. And if someone had not shared their story, I would not be sitting here myself. So I have hope that by me sharing my story, hopefully we can set a precedent to create mental and mental awareness campaign out here that can get people help. Right. But um, thank you for coming by. Thank you for the strength and courage to share your story. To anyone listening, anyone watching, please don't be scared um, to reach out to anyone. Like he said, um, he left a very powerful message. If you're willing to change, and then that's when the universe can align with you and then help you. Any last words you want to say before we go? Just pray to your Lord. <laughs> no matter what you're doing, yeah. no matter which depth you think you have reached, no matter what sins you think you're committing, Pray to your Lord, because we need to take conscious decisions to decide. If you do not decide to change, change will not happen. Don't wait for when you stop drinking, for when you stop fornicating, for when you stop watching porn to pray. The Lord wants you to repent, and therein lies your blessing. He will see your pain and su suffering while you're still in your vice, but as long as you pray to him to alleviate it, Along the way, he will make a way for you. As long as you take it one day at a time. Very powerful message. Thank you, Fahad. Thank you for having me as well. It numbs you. A nightmare. A horrible disease. These are just a few of the ways people have described mental illness in their lives. Whether it's you, your child, or a friend. Mental illness impacts all of us in the same ways. And that's why... The Mind Space Podcast is committed to uncovering mental illness and the impact it has.